Early is best known for his non-fiction book, Crazy, A Father's Search Through American Mental Health Madness, which was, which was one of two finalists for the 2007 Pulitzer Prize. His book chronicles his struggle to help his adult son after he develops a severe mental illness and is arrested. His son's arrest prompted Early to spend 10 months inside the Miami-Dade County Jail as a reporter. No, they didn't arrest him. They didn't arrest him. <laughs> but as a reporter, where he followed prisoners with mental disorders throughout the criminal justice system just to see what actually happened to them. His book has won awards for the American Psychiatric Association, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Mental Health America, and prompted CNN to name him as one of the nation's top mental wellness warriors. He was even invited by President Obama to speak at the White House summit about his son's illness and recovery. He served for five years as a parent member of the Interdepartmental Serious Mental Health Committee created by Congress to advise it on the federal mental health policy. A former Washington Post reporter, Pete has appeared five times before US Congress to testify about the need for mental health reform. He has spoken in 49 states and address legislators in five foreign countries. He writes regularly for the USA Today and Washington Post about mental health issues and also posts a weekly blog that is often cited by media. In a Washington Magazine cover story entitled Top Journalists, Washington Media Elite, Pete Early was described as one of a handful of journalists in America who have the power to introduce new ideas and give them new currency. He is the author of, this one says 11, but how many books? 22. 22, so we double. He has 22 books, including five New York Times bestsellers. His book, Family of Spies, Inside the John Walker Spy Ring, was a five-hour miniseries shown on CBS television. For his book, The Hot House, Life Inside Leavenworth Prison, Early spent a full year as a reporter inside the maximum security prison. His book, Circumstantial Evidence, helped to actually free an innocent man from Alabama's death row. And he won the Robert F. Kennedy Award for social justice. I'd like to present to you Pete Early. <laughs> wow, I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you. Jamie, it's so wonderful to hear you get up here and speak. Thank you for doing that. We need to listen to people with mental illness. Uh, too often, we tell them what to do instead of hearing their stories. Mm -hmm. And you put a face on it, which is so important. Thank you. Colonel Wells, thank you for having me speak to your officers yesterday. You are an inspiration. Uh, you know, officers, law enforcement, deal with more people with mental illness in a day than psychiatrists do. Mm -hmm. They're the front line. And having you recognize the importance is really, really powerful. So thank you. You're going to benefit the community. And what do I say about Lisa? <laughs> when she called me, I said, well, I usually just fly in and give a speech and leave. Oh, no. Not with Lisa, you know. <laughs> she has me talking on book clubs. She has me on a TV show in the morning. She has me talking to the law enforcement. Now I'm here, and I think after this, you're taking me down to St. Augustine Beach to talk to people, right? <laughs> greet, them on their, greet them in their swimsuits and say, hey, let me tell you about this. <laughs> you are an inspiration. Thank you so much. I, 
you know, the only way a community changes is if you have a leader who takes the reins. And in these two, we have powerful leaders for your community, and I'm eager to see what they do and, and what they make, make happen. So thank you very much. And I love the name of today, Day of Compassion, which is something we definitely all need. I am the father of an adult son with a serious mental illness. What's that mean? What's it feel like? It means I know what it is like to see a stranger occupying my son's body, to see someone who I saw when he was born all of a sudden become a whole different person. What does it mean? It means I'm the subject of whispers. Oh, if you have a child with mental illness, obviously there's something wrong with you. Or as one mental health professional told me before he found out I had a son with mental illness, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> I am the father of an adult son with a mental illness. What does that mean? It means that I have been forced to call the police, have two officers come, taser my son, hog time, and then make fun of him as he's laying there psychotic, talking about how God wants him to save a movie star. What does it mean? It means I have been accused of coddling my son. By whom? My own family, my own relatives, who have said, oh, you're making a big deal about this. He just needs to pull himself up by his own bootstrap. Mm -hmm. Means being judged by your family and friends. What does it mean? It means spending countless hours trying to convince your son to take medication because in his case, medication helps. And then having someone say, oh, those are all placebos. You really don't need those. And having him including a psychiatrist telling him that, go off as medication. What does it mean? It means holding your sobbing son in your arms like a baby, listening to him cry because everyone is telling him that he is something seriously wrong. He's not a real person, that no one wants to hire him, even though he has a college education, no one wants to date him or even be his friend. I know those feelings, every one of them, because they've happened to my son, Kevin, and to me. The first hint that something was going wrong with Kevin came while he was in college. He was a student at the Pratt University in New York, and we talked every Sunday. I lived down by Washington, D.C., and on this call, he said, Dad, my food doesn't taste good anymore, and then he hung up. And they called back and he said, Dad, I think I took five people, uh, homeless people to breakfast today, but I'm not sure. And I went, what? And he hung up, don't want to talk about it. Then he called right back and he said, Dad, I'm having a hard time telling when I'm dreaming and when I'm wide awake. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously something was wrong, so I raced to New York and my wife, Patty, uh, managed to get us in to see a psychiatrist, which I now realize was kind of a miracle. And that guy talked to him and he talked to him for about 10 minutes and he came out and he says, well, Mr. Early, if you're lucky, your son is using drugs. If not, he has bipolar disorder. Lucky if my son is using drugs? Well, a blood test showed he wasn't using drugs. And so the doctor said, look, Mr. Early, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, okay? Your son has bi bi bipolar disorder. He'll be required to take medication the rest of his life. They'll make him gain weight. He probably will become diabetic or obese. Chances are he'll never hold a full-time job. Marriage, don't count on it. Family, oh. That's not a good idea. Regular job, mm -hmm. there's a high probability he'll be arrested, a good chance he will self-medicate with drugs and alcohol, and oh yeah, persons with mental illness die 15 to 25 years before the rest of us. He wrote us a prescription and sent us out the door. Let's talk for a moment about that first encounter. Kevin knew something was wrong. He went voluntarily to see a psychiatrist. And we know that the chances of helping people are much higher if you can encounter them during their first break episode. But he was completely turned off and rejected by what that psychiatrist said. My wife was diagnosed with kidney cancer. What did we do? We read everything we could about it. And we said, we're going to beat these odds. Well, he did the same thing. He said to me, Dad, I'm not one of those people. I had to tell you one little funny incident. I remember it so clearly when we were leaving that psychiatrist's office, I was like, oh my gosh, what, what? 
And he was grinning. And I said, Kevin, did you hear what he said? Why are you grinning? He goes, oh, Dad, that guy's crazy. Don't pay attention. <laughs> In a way, Kevin was doing just what my wife did. He rejected that. He said, I'm going to do this. And quite frankly, the, the doctor's diagnosis was so grim, I didn't want to believe it either. So anyway, Kevin took the medication. He got better. He was doing well. And after a few months, he quit taking it. And I didn't think anything above it because, you know, if you have a headache, you take aspirin or whatever. I guess you don't take aspirin anymore. And it goes away. Flash forward 12 months. All of a sudden, I get a call from his older brother in New York. Come, Pete, you got to come. Quick, 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 Dad. Come. Kevin's crazy. So I drove to New York. Kevin had been walking around in Manhattan for five days. He barely slept. He hadn't eaten. He was convinced God had him on a secret message. And I got him in the car, and during that five-hour ride from Manhattan to Fairfax County, Virginia, where I live, outside Washington, D.C., he would laugh one minute, and then he'd begin crying the next. And I pleaded with him to take his medication, and he screamed, pills are poison, leave me alone. And we got to the emergency room, and just before we walked in, he said, Dad, how would you feel if someone you love killed himself? Well, we went inside, and the nurse rolled her eyes while Kevin was talking gibberish about how God had him on this secret mission. And then we were taken into a room away from everybody else because of how he was acting. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And after four hours, Kevin says, I'm not crazy. I'm, I, I'm, I'm out of here. And I said, hang on, son, hang on. And I went out and I literally grabbed a doctor. I'll never forget how he came in that room with his hands up as if he was surrendering. And he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Earl, I can't help your son. You haven't even examined him. It didn't matter. Under Virginia law, a person had to be in immediate, imminent danger, just like the Baker Act here in Florida, before you could be required to seek treatment. And the nurse had told him Kevin thought all pills were poison. And we'd been sitting there for four hours. So obviously, it wasn't, he wasn't dangerous. So he said to me, you seem like a good concerned dad. Why don't you bring him back after he hurts himself or tries to hurt you? So I took Kevin home, and during the next 48 hours, he, I watched him sink deeper and deeper into this mental abyss. At one point, he had tin foil wrapped around his head to keep the CIA from reading his thoughts. He slipped out of my house, slipped out early one morning. He broke into a stranger's house. He broke in to take a bubble bath. Luckily, no one was home. It took five police officers and an attack dog to get him out of there. And when they did, they took him to the mental health center. And I went racing over there, and I'll always thank this guy, a police officer standing outside. And he says, whoa, Mr. Early, before you go in there, let me give you some advice as a father to father. Unless you tell that doctor that your son has threatened to kill you, he will not qualify, and he will not go to a hospital. Well, he'll go to jail, and you do not want that. And I looked at him, and I said, but my son hasn't threatened to kill me, and he shrugged. So I tell you this, and I do it with no pride because it really hurt my relationship with my son, but I went in and I lied. I said my son was threatening me, and so he was held over for 72 hours and put into a hospital. 24 hours after he was admitted to that hospital, I got a call from his doctor. I'm sorry, Mr. Early. Your insurance company's not going to pay for this. They say he's not dangerous, so we're going to have to discharge him. I said, hold on. Hold on. Well, I called that insurance company, and I got nowhere until I happened to mention that I used to work at the Washington Post, and I happened to mention that I was friends with Mike Wallace of CBS 60 Minutes. <laughs> And Mike agreed to call that company. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine getting that call? Wow. Hi, this is Mike Wallace. <laughs> Why is he early son? He, all of a sudden, my son was allowed to stay in that hospital for a record-breaking 14 days. In the short time between our trip to New York and Kevin's hospitalization, I had lied to get him into treatment, and I had bullied people to get him there. And just when I thought things couldn't get worse, they did. I got a call from the Fairfax County Police my son was being charged with two felonies, breaking and entering, and destruction of property. I was so frustrated. Virginia law had kept me from getting him help. Now it wanted to punish him because of what he had done when he was psychotic. I said to my wife, I feel so helpless. 
I don't know what to do to help our son. And she said, why don't you do what you do best? Pete Early, a father, can't do much, but Pete Early, a journalist, can. Why don't you investigate this and, and figure out what's going on? Well, for once, I listened to my wife. <laughs> it's my only joke. That's it. I did some digging. What I discovered was what happened to Kevin is not an aberration. Right now, right now, each year, there are 2.2 million people with serious mental illness, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, and severe depression who are booked into jails. 2.2 million a year. One million are on probation. 365,000 are in jails and prisons. 40% of persons with mental illness have a serious encounter with law enforcement during their lives. 49% of all police shootings, 49% of all police shootings involve someone with a mental illness. Persons with serious mental illness are 16 times more likely to be shot by the police, and those with untreated mental illness are more likely to kill a police officer. Persons with serious mental illness are held in jails and prisons four to eight times longer than others charged with the very same crime. Persons with mental illness have a higher likelihood of getting additional charges when they're in jail because they can't follow orders. Persons with mental illness would cost seven times more than any other person inmate in a jail because they're so labor intensive to deal with them. And they have a 15% higher in, uh, recidivism rate than everyone age. 85% of persons with mental illness who end up in a jail have returned to those jails. And here in Florida, if you have a breakdown, like my son, and you live in Florida, the chances are five to one, five to one, that you'll, that person will end up in jail rather than getting help. That's outrageous. So I did decide that I'd write a book about this. First, I talked to my son. He said, well, who would want to read that? I said, I'm going to find a jail somewhere far away from Fairfax County because I don't want to irritate the prosecutor. And I'm going to go in that jail, and I'm going to follow people through the system.